Hare Krishna Lila Pushottam to humble obeisances. Welcome to the Monks Podcast. Dhanavad Pranam Chetan Charan Prabhu. Thank you very much for having me in your podcast. Hopefully we will have some fruitful discussion. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, Prabhu. You know, one of the things that attracted me to Krishna consciousness was the scientific presentation. I had read the Bhaktivedanta Institute's Origin magazine and a few other publications. And then I always uh, looked up to and appreciated devotees who presented Krishna consciousness in a rational, scientific way. And uh, it does seem that there are not many working in actively in the face, field of science and spirituality. So I, I do something, but I'm not a I was more of an engineer with an active interest in science than a hardcore scientist. And I have studied broadly the field of science and spirituality. But you are among the few people who have actually, in one sense, blended both these fields. You have a scientific degree and you have also active spiritual, not only spiritual practice, but spiritual outreach. So it's a privilege to have your association today. And I thought we could discuss on the topic of Bhagavad Sankhya and uh, science, if that's okay with you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, uh, it has been a great journey, uh, I would say, since I met uh, my teacher who taught me uh, Bhagavad Gita in 1993. I would say this is almost like 28 years of beautiful journey. Oh, okay. So, so was how did you first, were you interested in science, I say, or was it more of a profession or was it also something of a vocation or a hobby, hobby for you? And what was exactly your scientific background? Can you share for our reader, for our viewers? You see that, uh, okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question, actually. Uh, you see that we were born when TV was not there. Okay. And we were born and brought up in, in the nature's lab. And okay. uh, so naturally, uh, you know, there was no... Uh, you know, no so-called uh, motivated drive for us to do something. Whatever we did, it came out natural. That's what I, I see my life. It's not somebody told me, you do this, then I have to do this. You do this, you have to do this. No. So you, are, you are saying that the TV creates many artificial desires out of external... Obviously. I mean, that's what I, I feel. Because nowadays... Uh, Information explosion is so much, people have very little time to think about themselves. What in what way they can become happy, what way you know they would become naturally situated. So these these are the things that uh, no more there, at least in Indian uh, scenario now, because uh, I am literally traveling uh, literally every part of India and uh, I've seen how people have completely, you know, gone astray from their own nature. Oh. So, so, so you are saying that because there was no television, so if you took up science, it was because you were actually interested in science? Is that what? Yeah, you because you say that uh, my childhood and uh, school days were, uh, were filled with uh, uh, activities that I liked most. And uh, although I liked mathematics maximum, but uh, I was a naturally uh, a voracious reader. I, uh, you know, I read uh, literally all books in my library in those days, in my school days. So when, uh, by mistake, I entered into engineering, uh, but at the end of four years of my engineering at uh, Arisa Rorkela, I realized an emptiness within me. I realized that uh, something is missing. And hence, even if I had job here to go, there to go, here to go, but I still continued my journey because at, at some point of time, I realized what will make me happy is that I'm a naturally student. I so, like to learn. Uh, roughly, this was which year? When did you graduate? When did you? And 1988. 1988. That is when I, I realized okay. that I would learn. Uh, I, I would be happy uh, by becoming a student. So. And your graduation was in which specific engineering? Roughly? Yeah, in electrical engineering. Electric, okay. So you still felt there's something missing in your life? Yeah, you see that uh, uh, at some point of time in my graduating final years, 
uh, I spent a lot of time among my friends. And uh, once uh, you feel that you have become now alone after the graduation, everybody has gone out and you are alone. And I felt that I was cheated. I felt that this was a waste of time. I, I, I spent so much of time with them and they are not there. So this is a naturally a waste for me. So that, that really occurred to me. And I realized that if I would have invested, because uh, from my childhood, I was very philosophical. And uh, in my intermediate science time also, I read many philosophical books. I used to attend uh, uh, regular uh, classes uh, conducted on Aurobindo philosophy. That's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah. I've not seen many, say, Indian youth interested in specifically philosophy. So, was that a... Yeah, in, my, in, my, in my intermediate science, when I was studying in Provincial College, I was an award reader of uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti book, uh, uh, book of uh, Aurobindo. So, except uh, probably the Vaishnava books I didn't uh, uh, touch. Right. Your upbringing was religious or how was it? No, upbringing was not because uh, I was born in a very middle, uh, lower middle class family. My father was a, a clerk in a, in a uh, government uh, hospital, a you know, primary health center. Okay. So obviously, my only spirituality is, uh, is the, the spiritual tradition of Odisha. Because I was born in Odisha. Yes, Behera, yeah. So, so being born in Odisha, uh, you know, we used to uh, hear regularly Jagannath Bhajan. And uh, specifically during the Dasahara time, when the Ashtami would start, uh, the hearing all Devi uh, slokas uh, in glorification of Mother Durga. So we used to get up early morning take bath and open the All India Radio. And then we hear all those uh, slokas and you get uh, really fresh. So those, this, it was, we are born of a Odishan uh, religious culture to say. Okay. Yeah. So was this a broad, broadly religious culture or was it a Vaishnava culture? No, it is an Odia culture. You know, Odia we culture. had okay. uh, right, right, right. Odia culture. It is, you know, we have a lot of fascination for Jagannath Ratha Yatra. Right. Visiting Jagannath Temple in Puri was one of the always used to be, you know, fabulous time for all of us as a family, as an individual. So, so I would say I was born in a, a, a Odia religious culture, not a Western culture. Okay, yes. So you said in '93. You were introduced to Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. How did that happen? You see that in 88, uh, when I started searching for truth, uh, you know, I started my life with Bhagavad Gita and chanting Hare Krishna. So, okay. so the Bhagavad Gita, I started reading because my father was always reading Bhagavad Gita. And somewhere probably that seed was there my okay. father would never uh, do anything without reading. After taking bath, he would read one chapter of Bhagavad Gita and then he will leave for his office. Oh, okay. So, Bhagavad Gita uh, played a very important role in my life. Uh, so, when 88, I simply went to a bookstall, purchased the Bhagavad Gita. And in Aris Rorkela, there is to be a Max Mueller Bhavan. Just two kilometers from Arisabha. Okay. So there used to be a lot of you know editions of Bhagavad Gita. I still remember I used to get every week one Bhagavad Gita, I'll pick up, and I cannot understand ABC. The English was oh, okay. too tough and voluminous books. And you know, it it won't make me any sense because I was not good at English. Um, now I'm able to speak to in English. It's all kudos to Srila Prabhupada. By reading his books, I understood how to speak in English. Okay. Uh, but uh, 
those days, you know, it was very tough for me to read those English uh, Bhagavad Gita's and they're all impersonal commentaries and very hard English, very hard English. Oh, and, yes. uh, but fortunately, my association, one uh, sannyasi uh, lady, uh, monk, she handed over me a bhajan book. Okay. So, so every day before I go to bed, I would read some of the selected uh, bhajan. And one of them is uh, that uh, uh, Krishna ki Madhuri. That was uh, one of the very uh, famous song. I had I had it. it. And uh, and uh, at some point of time, while doing all this prayer, Hare Krishna Mahamantra came naturally. So I started uh, reciting every day. Of course, nobody told me that you have to chant in mala or this. But this became a part of life. You walk, you you do anything. So chanting Hare Krishna and uh, Bhagavad Gita. These are and I led a life of an asset um, from eighty eight to ninety three, uh, mostly eating salads, not talking to others, remaining within. So this was all before you were introduced directly to Krishna consciousness or ISKCON? Yeah, yeah, correct. correct. Oh, okay. Right. That's remarkable. So then which, uh, so which year were you actually introduced to ISKCON? You see, I, in, uh, I finished my master's again from Arish Rokila and then I became a lecturer there. And because of this spiritual bent up life uh, brought me uh, to a conclusion that I should not settle until I understand the purpose of life. So I shifted my base from Rorkila to Delhi. So there I, had, I got admission in PhD and, uh, uh, and then uh, there also I had certain illusion because I was thinking that scientists are the best people. They are the only honest people. So this kind of, uh, and we had already seen that how politics those days were so mod slinging and so forth. So, yeah. and uh, so obviously, when I came to IIT Delhi, I saw that uh, uh, you know there are uh, professors because those days uh, very few used to come for PhD. Uh, not many PhD students. Uh, okay. So I saw also there is a, a kind of a fight among the professors who get a PhD student. And, uh, and so many other things were there. So I had certain illusion about the scientists are the best. And that once that illusion is gone, you felt again back home. I said, why did I come here? What to be done here? Okay. And, so this is uh, this is where when I was and I joined one Sabha mission at that time. That was a, uh, uh, a NGO working okay. for uh, communal harmony. In 1992, there was a Bavari Masjid the demolition. So we were part of the effort to give protection to the minorities. And, and we used to go to slums to teach slum students every Sunday. So all those were part of life, but I was not feeling happy because every time you go to the slums, those children whom we taught last week, you won't find them. They were hiding. I said, why mm-hmm. do force teaching on someone when <laughs> they don't like it? And then okay. I met uh, Professor P. V. Krishnan oh, at IIT okay. Delhi. Okay. okay, he he joined IIT 1992 December. I joined IIT August 1991. Okay. And so one at one Sunday morning, a uh, Sunday afternoon or Saturday afternoon, he gave a lecture in our hostel. 
and he was playing a sadaputa prabhu's uh, video sim simulated body okay and even i was not aware of this lecture i had gone for this sabha mission work and returning i was returning and i saw a common room was filled so i entered at the end of the lecture he said that uh, i am taking bhagavad gita class in my house tuesday thursday and friday eh, saturday so that started my journey oh okay so current that's wonderful so this was about 96 or when was this 93 so 93 itself everything huh? you moved from uh, bihar 90, to 91 august i moved to delhi okay okay uh, 88 91 93 okay right uh, and then say currently you have a wide variety of services you are looking after the vindavan gurukul you also are uh, are a faculty so how did you decide to also get involved in scientific outreach per se are you specifically doing some scient- did you do some research in the area of science and spirituality or did you see that as a way of introducing people to spirituality or, or how is the science- say that uh, when we came to spiritual life uh, for us sadaputa prabhu became the uh, the icon yeah he is he is a brilliant person is so, so and uh, professor pv krishnan he used uh, all his uh, work in preaching so we yes. were fan of uh, sadapta prabhu but one of the thing in his style was that uh, is that he most of the time uh, you know found the limitation of the science Okay. and limitation of the science in addressing certain issues just like you started saying the origin and in fact origin i think that i must have read that origin at least uh, dozens of time uh, during my first two years oh okay. and uh, so basically sadapur prabhu said that okay science is very good but for certain things it is very limited uh, whether it is origin of life origin of uh, uh in years uh sciences and all of that so we and in fact within very few months i decided i will leave my phd and join in vrindavan that is what uh, my mindset was there. but i continued my phd because uh, professor pb krishna told that you must complete your phd so we completed it. okay so your phd was in which field i did my phd in artificial intelligence and robotics okay so now you seem to have given a lot of talks on bhagavad sankhya so was that a particular area of interest you developed over time as a as we could say no you say that uh, in the beginning you know we were you know we saw our teacher was preaching and he is able to use the scientific concept to uh, divert our attention to krishna that means he used science to get us attracted to krishna hmm. so so we also followed the same thing because after i finished my phd i went to pitspalani i preached there for four years so we have the same style we we'll make our slides based on origin magazine and and go out and, and please those days you know that you make those slides and mm. those uh, so these are different way of presentation in fact i remember i, I used to go to siri pilani and present among all those uh, big shirts and they will shout at me you are talking all uh, junk and still i will be very passionate uh, uh advocating what i'm saying is right and uh, during pilani rasras to came to pilani and gave a lecture and there he told that we can also interpret scientific data see data cannot be wrong data has been collected they are right okay. but we can give interpretation to the data 
Okay. So that led me uh, to have a stint in BI from 1999 to 2000. Okay. So, so I saw another perspective and all kudos to Rasaraj Prabhu that um, he brought out uh, uh, the idea that we can also contribute to the science. And, uh, and then I uh, left for Germany. From Germany, I came to IIT Kanpur. And now I'm here last 20 years in IIT Kanpur. Oh, okay. So is your direct field connected with science and spirituality or it is more of a science and spirituality, the area of research that he used is an area of study that he used for introducing people to spirituality? You see that uh, what happened... Uh, you know, over these 20 years, I am in IIT Kanpur. One is that once you are in IIT, uh, you have to uh, continue doing research. Stabilize yourself as a profession. Yes. That means you have to compete with your peers. Yes. Number one. Number two is that you have to uh, convert or uh, not convert, you have to preach to fellow students uh, who are coming to IIT Kanpur. Uh, so these two really occupied me because uh, my house was a temple. So every day, five o'clock, Mangalarti, and then chanting Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam class, and then everybody goes to their classes. Again in the evening, Bhagavad Gita class. And while doing that and maintaining professional life, uh, sucked all my energy it was hmm. but what happened in the process is that uh, I uh, kind of gave a lot of time to Prabhupada purpose and based on that I at some point of time I realized that there is no matter the way the scientists are talking everything is a form of consciousness so that was first awakening. This happened to me in 2008 or 2009 when I was in Zurich as a visiting professor. And uh, slowly, slowly, uh, you know, uh, I realized that uh, the, some of the uh, limiting point from my perspective using my own field of research AI uh, that where science has uh, met the dead end. Science has? Met the dead end. Okay. That means it is not able to progress further. Okay, right. So, so, mm -hmm. so this, so this, these are some, and, uh, and then, you know, you, you, you already know that, uh, uh, I took interest in Gurukul because uh, of my interest to set up a university. In 2011, I had given a white paper to GBC body in Mayapur that we must have an ISKCON operated university. And these are the, these are the goal why we should uh, uh, set up an university and uh, and of course once you think of setting up a university you must have an agenda because I cannot set up an university the way all universities because there are so many universities already there mm -hmm. what extra or new that we can offer to people so you have to create an agenda research agenda okay so this, because and you know, we got involved with the Bhaktivedanta Gurukul since 2010. So it's a long 11 years uh, and there is a lot of uh, brainstorming within me with, uh, with my students uh, about what should be the agenda if we have to set up a university. Yeah. Mm. Yes, for you. Thank you. So that's a so in one sense, you could say that uh, science is one aspect of your multifaceted services. You are cultivating students, 
you are di- to direct uh, devotional programs and uh, you are also creating a vision for a for a krishna conscious university and also because you have scientific background scientific interest so you also use that to present krishna conscious scientifically whenever uh, whenever there are any forums so you have that opportunity so maybe we can uh, focus on uh, you mentioned that you got some insights from your study in artificial intelligence so currently with respect to science there are two distinct uh, you because almost two distinct areas that with respect to applied science in terms of technology we are having um, dazzling even mind boggling progress in terms of how gadgets are improving how ai even ai is improving significantly at the same time in terms of conceptual understanding it does seem that science is meeting some kind of if not a dead end at least a wall which uh, which it doesn't know how to go beyond there are scientists who have written books like the end of physics and or even the end of science there are scientists who there are science opposite and from certainty to uncertainty how even the foundations of science are are becoming unclear because say the contradictions between quantum physics and relativity they are not so easy to resolve in fact people don't even have most scientists say that we don't even have idea how they could be resolved so from the point of view of theoretical understanding of the nature of reality it does seem that science is meeting a brick wall if not a dead end whereas most people because technology is advancing so much they may not even come to know that in terms of theoretical aspects science is not not progressing that much so what are the areas you feel that uh, science doesn't provide answers and that is the area where say our spiritual texts can provide some answers uh you see that the what is science science uh, uh and the sankhya there is no distinction the atheistic sankhya that is very popular in indian tradition and current science there is no difference it is basically the nature is the cause of everything so okay. whether you study the current science or sankhya philosophy because onus doesn't lie with anyone it's all due to nature so nobody takes the responsibility suppose you build a hospital or you still or a rubber bank no distinction both are happening by the laws of nature okay you still or you save a life so these are all laws of nature oh so this is uh, so current science you see what science is doing science is finally analyzing the experience finally everything is of all about experience and the irony is that we don't understand how in human cognition experience takes place hmm that's the how does experience takes pla- uh, take place within human cognition this is itself is unsolved problem yes within science i think this is co- this is you are referring with the hard problem of consciousness yeah the, the yes yes and and plus plus yes you are right this is the hard problem of consciousness and plus uh there is no idea of experience sir in science yes and that's true also in sankhya philosophy and this is where bagavad sankhya is different from both science and sankhya okay so in bagavad sankhya you have an experiencer and there is experience so the science and bagavad sankhya they they try to answer the same question the question is same what is the building block basic building block of the universe 
Hmm. Science tries to understand. Sankhya philosophy uh, tries to give the answer. And the answer is also there in Bhagavad Sankhya. Okay. But the approach is completely different. The approach in both Sankhya and science is a reductionist. Whereas Bhagavad Sankhya is holistic. So this is a okay. clear distinction between these two approaches. Okay. So, you know, this, uh, this is a key point about reductionistic and holistic approaches. And I have read quite a bit on this subject. There are atheistic scientists, or you could say even scientists in general, they acknowledge that science is reductionistic, but they say this is the reductionistic approach which actually helps us differentiate science from pseudoscience. So the example that often is given is that, say, when the Black Plague was spreading across Europe, at that time, many people thought this Black Plague is being caused by, by certain evil spirits, by certain such paranormal agents. And if scientists had stayed open to this idea, uh, scientists had believed in or believed in or accepted such things, we would never have found about germs. We have never found out how to cure. So how to cure those diseases? So they say that their argument, and I'm, I'm rephrasing, and I have my response to their arguments also, but I just rephrase it over here, that, that science is not necessarily metaphysically reductionistic, with, but meth methodologically, we are naturalistic. That natural phenomena should be explained in natural terms. And to the extent we explain them in natural terms, to that extent, we can understand those phenomena, we can research those phenomena, and then we can utilize those phenomena. So for example, Newton believed in God. And yet when he saw the apple falling, Newton, what made the apple fall? He didn't think God made it fall. If he had said God made it fall, then he would never have discovered gravity. So, so for science, it is the study of matter and the interactions of matter and the principles by which those interactions happen that is important. And so the argument often is that as soon as science goes beyond the reductionistic framework, it leads to a whole Pandora's box of invoking all kinds of paranormal supernatural agents, and it becomes a science stopper. If Newton had been satisfied with the expression, God causes the fruit to fall, we would have no gravity, we would have no physics, we would have no scientific advancement. So how would you respond to this? Yeah, very... Uh... No, see, I am uh, I'm not uh, here. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not really interested in uh, finding fault with the approach of the science. Okay. Uh, you see that uh, what Prabhupada said, and in particularly Easy Journey to Other Planets, um, the Pro Prabhupada's point was that uh, science has given us a process by which we do not take the natural world around us the face value. We look for the subtle cause within the nature that makes us feel the nature the way it is. Like for example, we watch a wall, according to Goldsman, he doesn't, he, he didn't see the wall, he saw molecules are dancing. Yes. So this idea of looking at the subtler picture of the world around hmm. is something that science must be credited. So you made a very striking point that our uh -huh. purpose is not to find fault with science. And then the second yeah. point you made was that science needs to be credited for, in a sense, going beyond Pratyaksha Pramana. Yes. To, to look beyond. Uh, so, so Prabhupada yeah. said that science must be given credit for finding the subtle cause of. Oh. So, so Prabhupada said that. So Prabhupada said science must be given credit for finding out or giving us a way how to find out the subtle cause of the natural world, the way it is manifesting around us. That's remarkable. You know, is, yeah. uh, at least I have not seen this in Life Comes From Life or 
Uh, many of no, it, is, it is there. I can give you also. No, that's, that makes sense. Uh, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but this is because one... you see that, uh, and because of that, science made progress because they could they could uh, unravel the subtle mystery behind the the physical nature, and mm. and that that is the success of the science. And they must be given the, you know, they must be given credit for what they have done. But still, Prabhupada is saying. The subtler than what they have achieved is even mind. Subtler than mind is intelligence. Subtler than intelligence is the false ego. And soul is the subtlest. So, so in a sense, we, we, we should be, we should coexist in a harmonious way because we are looking for the subtle cause. Okay. So if we can, we can show them how these subtler aspects of the truth are hidden in the nature. So both sides would accept. So that was the take of Srila Prabhupada. I'll just give you a little idea. Um, you say that how science started with the subtler class. Well, simply according to the basic building block of the universe. So they, in the beginning, they told us the periodic elements are the basic building block of the universe. Yes. Right? That all of us, hydrogen, helium, nitrogen, potassium, sodium, these are all basic. Hence, they were always exist, right? Yes. They are the elemental part. And then they realize that these are white lies. These are? And white lies. White, White lies. lies. Uh -huh. Okay, that means they are not the fundamental particles. Yeah. They okay. themselves recognize. And this is one of the aspects of science. Yeah, it has a self correction Science mechanism. accepts when they, they find there is a limitation. They say these are, these are David Tang, Professor David Tang, in his uh, uh, keynote lecture, uh, he, he says that when we were teaching our students that uh, periodic table elements are elementary particles, we are in fact telling them white lies. So is the scientists, they, they, they themselves, you can look at uh, Professor David Tang's lecture. Yes. And then, uh, you know, they, they, they suddenly found out, you know, it is not the uh, elementary particle, the periodic table elements are not, not elementary particles, but an electron and two quarks. In the beginning, they said neutron and pro proton. And then that uh, got converted to two quarks because of the refined theory, refined idea. And then suddenly they say the basic building block of the universe is electron and two quarks. And they realize again, this is also not true. And then they refined that idea. And now they are saying it is quantum field. Okay, this is a standard model of the particle. Okay, that's true. Uh, that this is this is what it is, right? Yes. Now, if you look at uh, what Bhagavad Sankhya says, Bhagavad Sankhya says, what is the basic building of the this universe? The Sata 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 Upanishad, the famous verse, the Tiyonitya Nam Chetana Chetana, Eko Bahuna Movidadhatika. So, basic building block of the universe, according to Bhagavad Sankhya, is that which is eternal, which is independent, and which has the capability to diversify. One becomes many. So, in a sense, Bhagavad Sankhya, basic building block of the universe is the absolute truth himself. Okay. So this you cannot bring in within the empirical science. Okay, yes. You see that? So Bhagavad Sankhya, the basic building block of the universe is the absolute truth. It's Krishna everywhere. Right? That's what we mm -hmm. learn. You know, in Bhagavad Sankhya, in Lord Kapila's teaching, you see he is present within as super soul, as time outside. There is nothing else. 
the cause of the entire everything that is happening are the two causes. Same Krishna, one in the form of super soul, the other is in the form of time. So oh. these are the things that you cannot bring in directly within the empirical science. So we have the answer, but we cannot bring them to the fold of empirical science. This is the bottom. Oh, so then you're saying that the science have to be expanded beyond the empirical domain or how do we go ahead? No, the, see, the science as of now is within empirical domain. Science has to be within empirical domain. Otherwise, yeah. as you told na, uh, in the beginning, that uh, uh, people would say supernatural thing, all kind of uh, superstition would come. So science is a beautiful creation by the arrangement of the time or the providence where it must remain within the empiricism. As of now, I don't see any alternative. So then basically what we will need to do is that explain to people how the empirical domain does not give a satisfactory experience of satisfactory explanation of reality in its completeness and how life has aspects beyond the empirical. And in that sense, uh, not point out the faults of the scientific method, but say explain that a holistic life needs to have more than the scientific approach to understanding reality. Would that be something which would yeah, be? Yeah, uh, you are right. Plus, uh, we can do a lot of positive contribution within empiricism. Oh, is it? How, how would that yes. be? I will just, first I will start with uh, a simple uh, research that all of us we can do. You know, I have not done it. You know, we did a research, but we have not published it. This is uh, simple. When we uh, got the our Gurukul land, Hmm. This Gurukul land was a salty land. Hmm. Because we are looking for a bigger piece of land. When uh, we were searching for a bigger piece of land in uh, Vrindavan, it was very difficult to find the contiguous land, 100 acre. So we found a land, we purchased it, but it was alkaline. And mm -hmm. the, the whole objective that for which I took the land because I wanted to establish a holistic lifestyle. We'll have our own goshala, we will grow our own food. You know, students will be taught how to live in the lap of nature, experience mm -hmm. varieties of life, understand the symbiosis that is existing and how we are connected to each other. So, so when you look at that, uh, you know, it was a bizarre situation for us to be in because uh, we took a place and that cannot grow anything. In fact, uh, even certain devotee district agriculture officers, they came and they said, you know, you can't do anything, apply urea, apply this and that. I said, no, I cannot apply urea. These all conservationists, they came and they said, no, you know, you are cheated, you can't do anything. Okay, but from the same land, now we are growing enough wheat, enough rice, enough vegetable, everything. Yeah. So we did an experiment actually in IIT Kanpur with my, one of my students. I took two plots of land. In one plot of land, we added Jiva Amruta. Jiva Amruta is a, a composition of a, uh, cow urine, cow dung, soil, jaggery, by which the uh, microbes residing within the cow dung can multiply into millions, into billions, or even trillions in 72 hours. Okay. So when you apply these, uh, uh, sprinkle this uh, liquid in the soil, and anchor the soil uh, with uh, some some you know some kind of ganjuvamruta, uh, which we call uh, the the dried cow dung. 
then automatically soil becomes livable because when the microbe they go they have to survive mm. so they make this soil livable and uh, our research actually proved very wonderful thing because we uh, you know we you know you can all visit our gurukul and you will see that we don't apply any synthetic thing no pesticide nothing we grow everything natural and everything very tasty right but i wanted to do a t- uh, research so one of my student what he did he took a two plot in one plot he applied the uh, this uh, cow jivamruta uh, and the other he didn't apply anything and then the corn makka corn seeds were sowed there and uh, we saw the rate of growth is twice where we applied the uh, the jivamruta okay so now jivamruta is is it a ayurvedic product or is it what is it exactly jivamruta means uh, you take uh, uh, one kg of uh, cow dung and uh, add their uh, the cow urine and okay. then this is a this is a formula by subhas palekar okay so this here i'm just trying to understand the context this is remarkable mm. but what mm. you're trying to say is that mm. drawing broader in drawing insights from the broader vedic tradition uh, we can contribute even to the area of empirical science right this right, you are giving right. an example exactly exactly okay so what 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 is happening this formula of jivamruta is is that you have microbe in the cow dung okay and it turns out to be these microbes are soil friendly microbe okay when they go and live in the soil soil becomes naturally porous lighter oh okay okay so so what happens that when i did this experiment i added this jivamruta this jivamruta has a certain formula i don't have exact number now but in is like you know you take uh, uh, 10 liters of uh, you know cow urine cow urine is a natural antiseptic what it does is that it won't allow external microbes to enter into the system so this is cow urine okay and cow dung has a natural microbe and you have to create a very uh, you know favorable uh, environment for this microbe to grow so what we do we add some water lot of water almost 100 liters of water and there we add some jaggery and chane powder okay so by this process what happens these microbes they grow into billions in 72 hours okay so every 15 days you just go and sprinkle this so what is the current scientific understanding current scientific understanding is soil is fertile if its sulfur content is this much nitrogen content is this much phosphorus content is this much calcium calcium content is this much these are the the current understanding of fertile soil subtle point is that we had two plot in one plot we added this uh, jivamruta the other plot we didn't add right okay now we are demonstrating empirically that where we applied the jivamruta the plants grew in thrice rate okay so okay so that is empirical evidence okay what science says science says that if the soil is fertile growth rate will be better yes that is and what is the basis of growth rate according to science soil composition if you look at the calcium content nitrogen content this should be more okay now what we did is that we took the samples of both the 
plot before sowing the seed and after we added jivamruta and we saw how the plants are growing in one and the other so when we took this soil samples we saw that soil composition is as it is in both the field oh both the okay. field soil composition are same oh okay soil composition has not changed my god so so what is the explanation so this is what i am trying to say and this this really requires a science scientific investigation it it remain because you know i am so busy in other things but once this uh, we are uh, you know in gurukula we are going to start uh, some new department uh, uh, to do this research and see what is i i know the answer the answer is that soil is now livable the soil fertility livable livable means alive yeah livable means the microbes and earthworm if they are able to live okay then livable. that okay, soil livable. is fertile okay livable okay okay so this is this is the conclusion but this has to be established so this cannot be established you know so easily because this would bring in the notion of science of relationship right the the microbe and soil they have a relationship these these these, these are all very very scientific core concepts that have to be brought in through rigorous scientific experiment and uh, so this is this is this is just one thing you know uh, we are able to show that the the so called idea of soil fertility it may be true in a relative sense but that's not absolute we are showing here a case where the soil is you know at least if you go by empiric science empiric science has no way to make an alkaline soil fertile they cannot make it we have made it fertile and we have made it fertile using vedic way okay okay so when the two questions here so wait a minute yeah. first question when you say vedic way you are saying yeah. that it is because it uses cow dung and other ingredients which are considered sacred in the vedic tradition because is this particular method mentioned in the vedic scriptures the sanskrit words or is it you are talking about vedic way in the sense of broad vedic tradition yeah yeah it it, it is known in vedic literature the cow dung has uh environmental friendly microbes just like yogurt has and man mental with a body friendly microbes okay this these are known these are known in ayurvedic medicines these are known things okay so so, so it may not be a specific phenomena that the, the specific transformation of say dead soil into uh, alkaline soil into livable soil that may not be mentioned but the principle that there is eco environment friendly uh, ingredients or and what did you say environment friendly microbes in cow dung environmental friendly microbes right, right okay right. so so you are saying with all the scientific advancement that science second question is the all the scientific advancement we have like ar the aridification of soil is a big problem in today's world because of various reasons the soil becomes non yeah yeah this is this is the, the, the entire punjab uh, yeah uh, punjab phenomena the so punjab phenomena is that too much uh, uh application of these uh, so called fertilizer based on sulfur content nitrogen content uh, ammonia content whatever you know the content it has really destroyed the soil so if i understand right what you are saying is this could potentially be a solution to huge problems exactly so, okay exactly and now just to take this point further so if i understand right what you are saying is that rather than trying to um get science to expand its domain beyond the empirical we look at whatever is there in the broad vedic 
body vedic body of knowledge and see how that can be demonstrated empirically and by and that, demonstrated empirically and bring out a new yeah. science so no once you bring that out into science so what will happen is that more people will develop appreciation openness and you can even say faith at some level in the vedic body of knowledge and not only they, vedic body because what it talks about there is a holistic approach to do things holistic approach to do things i i i will give also two more examples but here let me explain to you what is holistic approach okay uh you see that uh, when we got this land in gurukula and everybody were criticizing us we were really under pressure because of the alkaline soil and we have invested a lot of money mm. and um, so wherever i used to go i used to go to a or- different organic farm once i went uh, i was teaching bhagavad gita in i am indoor as a credit course and that time there i visited one organic farm one mr dike a uh, uh, maratha brahmin he was a he has a you know organic farm there so he welcomed me said uh, professor swagatham and he was holding a huge piece of uh, soil and told me what what is the weight of this then when i saw it's a huge i said maybe 10 15 kilo he said please hold it so so i tightened my muscle because i realized it's 10 15 kilo and then when he handed over i realized this is less than a kilo it's so light I asked him why it's so light. He said that this has more than ten to the power fourteen microns. They have made this soil so porous, so light. It is naturally amenable for the growth of the plant because plant takes the breather. A plant breathes through its root. If the soil is naturally porous, plant will naturally grow. and then i he said uh, i saw in one of the corner of his thing some people are spraying something so i asked him you are an organic farmer and that's why i came to you with the advice but i feel that you are sprinkling some pesticide there so he smiled at me and said please go and look at it so when i went there and i asked those farmers what are doing here i looked at their arar plant you know arar dal arar dal hmm. so so these are all arar plants and they are sprinkling something as what are you sprinkling they said jaggery water i was surprised why you are sprinkling jaggery water then they said this is a pollination time if i sprinkle jaggery water it will invite the bees so when bees would come they would increase the pollination the yield would be more you see that how brilliant idea of this holistic cycle you have microbes that is coming from cow dung they are helping the plants to uh, sorry uh, the soil to be livable and for us plants grow then they have you have bees they are helping with pollination and there are the farmers they see there is a friendship there is a cycle of relationship between all these things and you have to live with that instead of using pesticide and so called the current idea of fertility you kill all these things now our soil don't have microbes our soil don't have earthworms our you know you and because they are not there bees are also not there so the there is a break in the equilibrium of this 84 life cycles 84 lakh life cycle uh, lakh life cycle, life cycles so this is what is the problem of the modern science so this is what i was telling you what is the holistic science here? Oh, is that let me, uh, let me rearticulate this what you are saying uh, that 
there are natural so there are natural ways of also doing pollination so where we we could use jaggery water and get be uh, get the appropriate insects birds to come and in that there is the involvement of the various species within nature and then Correct. that leads to a holistic approach exactly. but within modern science the reductionist approach means that instead of involving nature we try to replicate and create substances or we use chemicals or we use other things and in that sense we look at only one part of okay this is we want this this soil to become fertile but in that process what are the natural ways of doing it we are not looking at that we, we are, are destroying we are destroying the environment we are oh, destroying okay. The okay we are destroying the environment see yes. human life will be more meaningful when they can appreciate the reason for existence of 8.4 million life cycles life forms okay so this is interesting so now overall i have also observed that uh, in the western world as well as in mainstream academia there is a significant shift from even in the domain of spirituality and also domain of science and spirituality the focus is shifting more from say ontological dimension to applicational dimension that means uh, whether something like a mind or a soul exists or not that is not so much a matter of debate uh, but mindfulness meditation do they help and there are a lot of empirical evidences to demonstrate that do they 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 seem to help people deal with the depression deal with stress so similarly what we are saying is what you if i understand right what you're saying is that by focusing in the applicational domain where we can demonstrate empirically the results so now as a way of explaining those empirical results then we can provide a holistic model so the model itself may not be directly empirically provable but the results of that empirical mo- that model can be provable and then eventually as we take this backward then you talked about the bhagavad sankhya the first principle is the that there is one living one supreme being who expands so that way in one sense we don't try to prove the world view but we sh- demonstrate the workability and not only the workability but the feasibility the value of that world view and then gradually people become more open to that world view is that where you are driving at overall yeah yeah I, actually you are right uh, in many ways um uh the, let me first address your first part of your question uh that uh, mind brain connection Okay, you no, see, that, that was just an example I was giving, but uh, yeah, yeah, but but that's that's a very important point because I want to address that point because you okay art art of I'm on a mindfulness. Yes, uh, you see that uh, what is the current science talking about? Current science is talking about what is mind, brain in action, brain in action. That is mind, brain. Okay, brain in action, brain in action. Right. Okay. Yes, brain in action. is what is mind right yes yes and can i study mind using empiricism as of now not no not at all in fact uh, i can't study because mind is so subtle that i don't have you know you can measure the mind becoming subtler than the mind if you really want to do empiricism with the mind then you have to subtler than the mind and which yogis could do it and that is why they could have the siddhis right so so that's the completely different that is that is that what we are not recommending so how can we study mind as subtler than the brain this is very important hmm. and we can study because uh, uh i will just explain to you uh two of our experiments uh recently we have published uh, these papers uh, one is in scientific reports where uh, we are demonstrating uh, the efficacy of rag darwari of oh? rag darwari you know raga yes. classical oh, okay, music okay okay right 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 yes so raga rag darwari have you heard about darwari yes yes yes, yes. i think yeah. is this the, that is the devo- devotee from uh, iit sham murari yeah sham murari yeah he, i mean i know him quite well yeah I, yeah yeah. Uh, yeah okay 
He told me about yeah. it. it was quite quite well received. It was published yeah. in the extreme pop papers also. Yeah, yeah. Also. So, uh, so, so what what is that uh, result is showing? That result is showing. You see, so your brain has different parts, right? Whether it is parietal, occipital, frontal, and what was seen so when we have sangha means we are always associating with something or other. We are never neutral. And because of that, and mostly, uh, we are supposed to have satsangha, but we don't have satsangha. We have a satsangha. And, and the reason of that, you know, there is a lot of noise in the brain. Brain, they have crosstalk. Because of crosstalking, you do not digest or internalize the meaningful information. So what happened using Ragdarvari, when you apply the Ragdarvari, administer Ragdarvari uh, to subjects, immediately these channels of cross-talking, they break. Okay. Channels? And, and they break. Which channels? The channel of cross-talking. Oh, really? That means... Okay, okay, cross-talk. Yeah, cross-talk. That means your parental, uh, sorry, parietal lobe is talking to frontal lobe, frontal lobe is talking to occipital lobe. So like that, each part of the brain is talking to each other when you are in asatsanga, right? Now in Krishna conscious term, I am telling, okay. I cannot tell this using scientific language. So, and Ragdharavari, what we are talking, this is a mode of goodness because it's a classical music, right? Okay. So when you brought in mode of goodness, then this cross topic stopped. Oh, and that is empirically demonstrable. A empirical yes. demonstrable. And what we saw is that after that, you suppose you give a person to focus, he studies, memorizes then efficacy increases. Mm, that's there is a cognitive enhancement. Oh, okay. That's amazing. And is this specifically for Rag Darbari only? Or, no, even any. West, but no. Because even the Western you, you world... You cannot... You see... You yeah, talk, even the Western you world... The Western world also, there is music, like rock music and others may be very passionate. But uh, there also, you know, we have, we have Mozart and Beethoven and others. Their music is also right. very calming. right. Any, any, anything in mode of goodness should work. Okay. Anything that in mode of goodness should work. The, the, the other piece of work that we just submitted is, uh, is the sleep quality, enhancement of sleep quality. Okay. You see, normally, uh, this nowadays, is very, these are very promising fields. Yeah. yeah. You huge potential. In fact, they like, not only they have huge potential, they actually serve a very urgent human need. Right, right, right. Hmm. You see that uh, most of us are very fatigued, stressed out, depressed. You know, so many, you know, and hence uh, we don't have good sleep. Hmm. When you don't have a good sleep, obviously, how hard you may try, your performance would be mediocre. And that is why you will see in Bhagavad Sankhya, one of the characteristic of intelligence is sleep. Okay. Mm. Even modern science says we must sleep. Or the, the, the good sleep you get between 9 o'clock in the night and 3 o'clock in the morning. 9 to 3. That's the best time. So that is why any sleep therapist would say suppose you want 8 hours of sleep. 9 to 3 is compulsory. You can add another 2 hours. This is 6 hours. 2 hours you can add after or before? This is uh, this is supported by modern science also. Modern science. This is modern science. This is modern science. Yes, yes. I know Ayurveda talks about say nine to three sleep is much better than twelve to six. Yeah. But I didn't. No, know no, this is modern, modern, modern science. Modern science. Yes. Oh, okay. This is then how 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 we get it? It is simple. Let me tell you. We get easy signal. Okay. And in easy signal, we look at different waves. 
alpha wave, gamma wave, beta wave, there are different waves. Are there. Yes. Right. So, and there are different huts. Right. Okay. Different frequency. Right. So, the lowest frequency means you have a better sleep. Okay. Yes. So, okay. so what has been demonstrated, if I understand is when people sleep for nine to nine to three, there, uh, there's their EEG shows lower frequencies. Yes, obviously. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you, you get a better sleep if you are regular between nine to three. You get REM, non-REM sleep. And there are, of course, now I have forgotten those. Uh, I used to teach also these uh, things. Uh, as of now, I uh, don't remember. But the nine to three is the best. But the point is that Nowadays, people sleep always after 12 o'clock. Lifestyle has changed. Hmm. They have a good sleep, bad sleep. And because of cumulative effort, effect, cumulative effect, hmm. their sleep has degraded so much that they have insomnia, they have sleep apnea, and there are so many things. A huge amount of problems, agreed. Huge amount of problems. So what I I have developed a Hare Krishna based uh, cognitive behavior therapy. Where what I do, uh, you know, we bring a batch of students. I make them to do a little exercise, and then I play Prabhupada that popular Hare Krishna tune, and make them dance. So by that process, they get a little tired, right? And then I put them in Savasana. Okay. So after Savasana, I made them to relax. By the time, because they have done some 10, 15 minutes of exercise, literally most of them, they go to sleep. And, and I, I normally uh, travel around wherever they are lying down and I could figure out who is sleeping. Right? So I will pat at their uh, cheek to make them awake. And once they come, uh, they, they become alert, I play Hare Krishna Mahapatra. Sweet, soft tune. And doesn't matter whether they are believer, non-believer, doesn't matter. Because now they have come out of the fatigue, little rest they got five minutes, whatever rest in Savasana, they got. That was sufficient for them now to be observed in Hare Krishna Mantra. That's so true. And I make them listen for 15 minutes. And then they will get, uh, get up and sit in mostly uh, in a lotus posture or normal posture, but eyes closed. Now I tell them you start singing. And they also happily sing. Nobody objects. And then we take the sleep quality after they go to sleep. And then we make them sleep. And then we extract the sleep quality. And okay. we found that uh, there is a, you know, uh, a significant improvement in the sleep quality. Significant improvement. Oh, okay. So, so what? Has this, what? What has is this? Is but that this is lack the Has this also been published somewhere as such? I just we we submitted. Uh, okay. I think uh, a month back we submitted. We are looking for uh, mm. the feedback. Okay. See, the, the, some of the things here you see that uh, this kind of research is new to us in the sense, uh, you know, these are all psychological research. Psychological research means you have to have a certain uh, uh, investigation parameters to be right. Yes. Okay. So there is an experimental group, there is a control group. So these are the things we were not familiar, right? Now we are getting familiar with it. And, uh, and so it takes time. But once we start doing things, it will be faster. So 
So what I'm saying is that through this kind of research, we are able to show what is the importance of satsanga. By satsanga, you are using generically the uh, sattva. Generically, yeah. Okay. These are all, you know, we, we, it's not only satsanga you listen to Bhagavad Gita. And okay. This is because the mode, what is satsanga? First, the first part of satsanga is mode of goodness. Yes, that is true. Right. Yeah, in one sense, mode of goodness will be more easy to demonstrate than transcendence. Yeah. So how, how would you actually demonstrate the effect of transcendence on the brain? Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Yes. All right. So, so, so this is fascinating. Now, yeah. just let me try to, you, you, we were discussing about, so empirically, de, empirically demonstrating things. Now, when we do this, we could say that we are encouraging people to come more towards sattva and then we are also exactly. providing them practices from mm -hmm. within our own tradition by exactly. which we can come to sattva. Exactly. Now, if, we, if people want, they may look for practices from their own tradition also. Yeah. But the point is, this doesn't come off as sectarian. Yeah. Because it is in one sense, uh, equipping people with resources for dealing with their, their problems. And... Uh, so this seems to be a very rich area for research, isn't it? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So let me just, uh, we discussed two areas. One is environment and the other is you could say psychology. And both of these are areas where people are looking for solutions. And in many ways, especially in, uh, I would say, we, as we are moving from modern to postmodern times, and in modern times, there was a very strong opposition in one sense toward anything beyond science reductionistic model. But in the postmodern times, as we are moving toward, there is a greater amount of openness that it's like the question is shifting from what is to what works. So in that sense, there is a big opportunity for us to, uh, to utilize this. So have you uh, also... Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a that, that there is also other aspect. Other aspect is to, is that one is that we are uh, showing the importance of uh, importance of uh, mode of goodness or satsanga to holistic development of our mm -hmm. human creativity, right? Yes. So because this is this is. But while doing this, we can also develop the science out of it, which we have not done. Like as I told you in the environmental case, that the soil composition in both the field was same. But in one, due to the more mi microbes, the, 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 the crop is growing at a faster rate, mm. but the other is not growing. So we have not brought out the science of it. Like the modern empiric empirical science talks about soil fertility in terms of this much sulfur, this much calcium, this much nitrogen. We have to. So this science is necessary. And it will take time. But sooner it will happen, provided we all come together, we realize that how we can bring out a science. A holistic oh. science. Okay, so let, wait a minute. So what you are saying is that even if we have empirically demonstrated certain results, we still have to, when you say we have to bring out the science means, we have to provide a theoretical model. Model, model, model. Okay. We have to give a model. So that like, like, for example, yeah. uh, you see that uh, this particularly uh, the this science of relation that I'm talking about, I'm working of an idea of universal semantic space. Universal semantic space. Okay. okay. So what is that universal semantic space? Universal semantic space is a unitary whole. Is the unitary whole. And that grows based on its association with other semantic elements. Okay. Okay. So okay. this is this is some idea. Uh, of is this course, theory in uh... This is in which branch of science, the idea of universal semantic space? This is from... You know, this is, you can say probably it is a, 
cognitive science. This, this okay. is the cognitive science. Cognitive science. Okay. Because we are trying to explain. Uh, see, uh, let let me make it make it clear. What 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 is the distinction? Scientists studied only matter. Yes, that is true. For them, matter, living matter, no distinction. Okay. That's See, right. yeah. we have matter, then living matter, then pure consciousness. Hmm. We have three levels. In Bhagavad Samkhya, we have three levels. Matter, living matter, and then pure consciousness. Really? Is there a category called living matter? I thought it's Purusha and Prakriti. Huh. So, uh, what would be Sanskrit word for living matter? Living matter is... Uh, uh, is the is the is the is the, uh, is, is the body is the, is the is the is the combination of gross and subtle body uh, where it is you could say where there is a where there is consciousness present in it consciousness present. okay Correct. so you know there is uh, one we talk about the six changes that means the living matter means cognitive elements okay. we can say like yeah, so one way we talk about it often is that there are six changes that happen when there uh, is a matter with consciousness or life. Exactly, presence. exactly. And otherwise, so we can we can we can say one is matter without cognition, matter with cognition, and then there is pure cognition, scientific term. Oh, okay. So what is missing here that we studied, we talked about only matter. In one spectrum. The other spectrum, spiritualists, they talked about only pure consciousness. And the process, what we missed is this living matter. Oh, okay. And I personally believe is that this century will be study of this living matter. That's amazing. And there is a lot of uh, exciting or uh, at least promising research going on in, in say, we have making vaccines or we are making tissue, uh, tissue culture or even, uh, even trying to make artificial life. So living matter is a big field of research right now. Mm. Of course, the, the presumptions that science brings into it may be reductionistic. But still, again, the point is that there is, there is research going on over here. Yeah, the yeah. research is going on, but they do research. See, in, in Ayurveda, you have uh, a professor in Ames, Delhi, uh, Professor Jayasundar, uh, Jayasundar and uh, she was telling uh, that when you want to make an Ayurvedic medicine, you have to, get, you have to select uh, full moon night because the, you know that uh, the sun's uh, moon sign is like medicine. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. You, oh. What is that verse in the uh, 15th chapter? Oh. Uh, Maham no, before that. Uh, Soma Bhutva Rasatmaka. Ushnami Chaushadi Sarva, Soma Bhutva uh, Rasatmaka. Okay. Uh, right. 15, so 15, you, yeah. you have to select the full moon night and then you have to offer certain prayer to that medicinal plant and then you have to take whatever you need to make your medicine. Right. So, so there is a process. So it is not uh, you simply cut the plant and take it and uh, think it is just out and out matter and uh, you are making a medicine. No. So, but what uh, now we have to demonstrate that uh, living matter has to be treated differently. Not like matter. Like, for example, for Ayurveda, eh, for uh, allopathy, this body is a simple matter. And allopathic medicines are simple poison. Of course, you know, if you demonstrate it, then, then all those doctors will come and, uh, and uh, shout at me. But that's, that is their approach. We have to accept it. They don't, the, no allopathic medicine is being uh, designed uh, based on cognitive. Uh, elemental science. 
that this living matter is a cognitive element. Every uh, cell is also conscious. And not only that I am wholly conscious, even every cell of my body is conscious. So this, uh, these are uh, you know, profound ideas and these, these are all ideas from our Veda, right? Vedantic idea. And uh, so hence, uh, uh, having a perspective of Vedantic idea and then doing research on living matter would be the new way to take the science further within the empiricism. Oh, okay. So now, broadly speaking, how much of it is really Bhagavad Sankhya? Because at one level, I mean, I appreciate the areas which you are talking about discussing. They're very important and we can make significant contributions. But uh, so you're talking about this threefold category used Matter, living matter, and third was consciousness, or was pure conscious, pure conscious, pure consciousness, or the other was you said that matter with cogn without cognition, matter with cognition, and then pure cognition, pure cognition. Okay, so so now this matter with cognition, uh, that is it a is it a conceptual category that uh, we will be focusing on studying. Because of the interface with modern science, because as I said, Purusha and Prakriti, we don't really have a this category of uh, living matter. So, so the point I'm making over here is that uh, there is a okay, let's put it this way, there is a need in contemporary society for certain branches of knowledge, say like how to how to sleep better or how to live more eco-friendly, and there and there is the broad Vedic body of wisdom from which we are drawing some things which address these needs. Mm -hmm. So when we when, when you said that we are sh we we may show the empirical research but still we have to sh show a model we have to build a model. So what would the model look like? When you talk about the model, are we going to, in one sense, pre present the whole Bhagavad Sankhya model because that at one level is not really demonstrable. Uh, that yeah yeah you see what is the in totality of Bhagavad Sankhya? Bhagavad Sankhya is that how uh, the unmanifested uh, material energy in the form of Pradhan became manifested Prakriti through or under the active direction of uh, super soul and time. This is exactly Bhagavad Samkhya is talking about the evolution of categories, manifested categories from unmanifested equilibrium nature. Right? Okay. So, so this is actually cognitive element. This matter is not the matter that science studies. Eh, sorry, yes, this matter is not the matter science studies. This is cognitive matter. So in Bhagavad Sankhya, the elemental representation is that of cognitive matter. It is not oh. the ignorant matter. Oh, okay. So, so that now, is a distinction. So now when you give the example of say Ayurvedic medicine being performed made at a particular time, mm. so are you saying then from that category, we, is there something like non-living matter at all? Because in one sense, the Atma is present. There is, there is, there is, uh, you know, I won't say, when I say living matter means, uh, you know, to make people understand what is, you know, it's not that matter is, living. when I, I say matter. That, I understand that point. Yeah, yeah point cognitive that, matter. Cognitive, cognitive matter. Basically, cognitive matter. There is, there is, uh, there is, so, uh, so, so, some, so element there is some element yes. of consciousness is present in that matter. By which it behaves in somewhat different ways from normal. Because th that is that is the nature. The soul is everywhere. Sarvagata sthan. So even within the stone, soul is there. Within the sand, soul is there. That is where they give. Okay, so so now we could. That means you could. So if a particular medicine is prepared at a particular time, that means those those cognitive elements. 
that are present at that person at the time of full moon or something like that so they are affected in a particular way yes and, so that and, is why uh, we have to treat them in a way they feel also graceful that means when we offer prayer to a medicinal plant we are begging for his grace so plant feels happy to part with its own body which you can take that means when you cut the you cut by force plant mm. is unhappy so in that cognitive element already the impression of sadness is there so when you consume that you won't be happy but when a plant gracefully shares his body then in that body there is happiness so it is more nourishing to the body to the human body mm. so this is the psychology that's amazing and at one level it makes such eminent sense and as you you know humans are in one sense in some ways human consciousness is expanding there's a lot of concern about animal rights nowadays and how people are moving toward veganism because they see how much animals are being slaughtered so as as devotees when we don't when we present our food we don't just say vegetarian food it's a it's violence free food so people are becoming aware of consciousness being presented present far beyond what we normal what mainstream western society thought was the domain of consciousness so that was anthropocentrism to some extent so this is amazing so prabhu do you have a team of devotees doing this research because this seems yeah on- i'm i'm creating because you said that gurukul patrivedanta gurukul we have a school now okay we are in the process of setting up two department okay see always i thought that why should i build a university there are so many universities sorry there are so many there are already so many universities why should we build a university okay what is the reason for building a university right hmm. so so that that made me think that we should build a university that must be different from existing university that means the existing existing university are not able to contribute to the society in a specific way hopefully we can do that particularly as of now currently the psychic patients are increasing everywhere yeah there are reasons psychic patients are increasing because mode of goodness is lesser 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 let us face this fact mode of goodness is reducing like anything and hence there is depression there is stress there is you know so many uh, other psychic phenomena that is coming and uh, and i was i am hoping that this university uh, when we are we are talking about brindaranyam college and then brindaranyam university so a college we start with the two department one is a, a school of uh, theology and sanskrit studies and the second is uh, cognitive science so so everything that we talk about can come whatever we discuss and more than whatever we have not discussed can come under this two category and and that would uh, uh, can be sub branched later and will take different departments in the future and will uh, make up a uh, or will give a shape to a futuristic university that is my hope so you are saying that uh, gurukul is so for gurukul to university it will take at least two decades isn't it one and a half two decades obviously oh. obviously that's a remarkable long term vision and i think it's required for having an impact in that area a, a substantial impact so now mm, to i mean we could go on discussing a lot of subjects but i don't i want to respect your time also i two three questions i would like to ask before we conclude 
So first is that if devotees or uh, those who hear the podcast would like to know more about your research or would some they may be interested in exp- joining in this research or in taking guidance for the research, yeah, are there some places where they can contact you? Is there some website or some email or somewhere? Uh, yeah, they can all write to me because uh, my email ID is already there in my website, IIT Kanpur. So okay. that is the best way to reach me. Okay. And uh, and particularly, I, you know, we need more researchers. There is no doubt. But those who can do full time research, uh, they can come. We will provide them space in Gurukul. And we have a lot of problems, many many problems. And uh, if they are ready to dedicate, then they can really enjoy their research. And more important, uh, Gurukul, beautiful ambience. Mm. Uh, Beautiful ambience, organic farming, Gaushala, uh, you know, is uh, is far from the crowded Vrindavan. Uh, you know, its uh, its ambience is highly spiritual. So, people, uh, it is very intoxicating for uh, doing in depth study. No. Yes. So, is this? Uh, so, do you have a formal institute for doing this kind of research, or? Uh, yeah, we, kind of- we 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 are going to. Uh, uh, affiliate our college. First, we start with the college, Rundaranyam College, and this college will be affiliated soon. And we are we are hoping to launch by twenty twenty two. Oh, next year, twenty twenty two. Oh, okay, that's yeah. Oh, okay, that's remarkable. And uh, currently, so you are also. So how is the receptivity for this kind of research in India itself? Do you get support and appreciation? Because in one sense, what you are doing doesn't seem like you are promoting a particular religious group. You are promoting universal values at one level. So are you getting a good response in the... Uh, and in I, the... I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping because you see, uh, you see every uh, uh, the, the, the society will have... Uh, uh, acceptance when you give a solution to their major problem. Hmm. So, so we are giving. You know, the the this this particular university will be known for giving psychic treatment, psychic knowledge, uh, and, and this psychic knowledge is not only confined to human beings. When we talk about environment, we have to have a psychic knowledge about the plants, psychic knowledge about the animals, uh, other uh, 8.4 million different species. So there is psychic character to everything. And we have seen this. I'm not, for my experience, I have seen plants, they grow very happily, nicely, if Hare Krishna Man Mantra is going on around them. And when, uh, you know, recently we were in a water in IIT Kanpur and there was a mango, mango tree. It's a very old tree and uh, it's about to die. But since uh, we came to that uh, house and always there was chanting, Kirtan, and this mango tree gave us a lot of fruits. And the day we left that quarter, next year, the plant died. And died, and uh, and similar experience I have in many places wherever I have gone and I immediately left. You know the impact on these things, and they need to be brought out. They need to be brought out in a scientific way, uh, not in a dogmatic way. Uh, so, uh, so there is a lot of scope because uh, I will give you a simple example. Six months back. One European girl became very depressed, very depressed. And one of my scientific colleagues from France, Paris, uh, he is a little different than the so called uh, uh, scientist. He sent uh, this girl to an organic farm. Organic farm. Mm. And the girl got cured within two months. Within two months. So, yeah, these are not something new. 
but then you have to add some scientific values to these things so that they the young people can accept it yes you know one of the things what you said about depression there's a lot yeah. of research into equine therapy like mm. you can go into stables and take care of horses yeah and uh, they do seem to heal quite a bit i have been inquiring whether we can do something about bovine therapy also if you like <laughs> <laughs> come and take care of cows yes we we need to do that yeah we need to do that and it is a, it is actually scientific to live among cows is highly scientific mm. we lead a very balanced spiritual and holistic life mm makes sense so in one sense what uh, in what prabhupada that one level told us to chant hari krishna and that is could say direct spiritual activity direct devotion activities but prabhupada also was quite strong in talking about satvik living and if we can focus on demonstrating how satvik living act, benefits the environment benefits individuals and especially we can demonstrate scientifically there will be a i see the potential is huge yes yeah yes so presently so when you are working in uh, in iit kanpur so it, is that uh, your area of work is different from your area of research isn't it or now I, now because uh, you know some 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 of the students are working directly in these areas now okay one of one of my phd students is working on mantra based uh, uh, cognitive therapy directly oh. hari krishna mantra based cognitive therapy uh, there are people uh, there are students who are working on uh, uh, different ragas uh, uh, the effect of different ragas on the okay psychic uh, uh, cure so so some problems uh, we are doing sleep therapy also we are working on uh, but uh, now i want to you know set up a mind and brain laboratory in gurukul so i don't say brain and mind if you go to the all western science hmm. the lab is brain and mind not mind and brain yes okay because for them brain is first and mind is next Hmm. Whereas for us, because according to Bhagavad Sankhya, mind is the only element in the body which is in mode of goodness. So when mind is subjected to rajas and tamas, you get depressed. So and that is why people naturally feel happy when they are in sea beach or in a natural scenic place, which are mode of goodness, because mind is naturally mode of goodness. So hmm. it is not something. Uh, Is, so, there any, is there any empirical way? That's what I, one of the questions I'm going to ask. Are there any empirical parameters to demonstrate the three modes, or how do we correlate that this is mode of goodness, this is mode of passion? Is it like an intuitive understanding? One thing you talk about is the brain waves and yeah, that. so so that that characterizes just like people slowly slowly brought out the idea of hydrogen, helium, nitrogen. I'm pretty sure in ten fifteen years. if uh, a sufficient number of researchers they come forward and work they can create a biomarker for mode of goodness biomarker for mode of ignorance and biomarker for mode of uh, mode of uh, passion and in fact uh, see in bhagavad gita krishna says everybody must work according to their nature yes we don't understand what is our nature so if we have found out what are our bio on biomarkers then we can easily tell people what is your nature and do that particular work which is according to nature so that is again uh, will be helpful to set up a proper varnasram now what is happening we have varnasram but this is polluted or distorted varnasram because my nature is different but i am working something else. yes this is the core problem of the modern society particularly in indian society in 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 a society whoever is born they are told that you prepare for iit je ha huh? so true completely being oblivious to what is that mm. so now 
in you have quoted ayurveda quite often how is the receptivity to ayurveda in the mainstream scientific uh, world one way you can say is that you also pointed out that it's big pharma and there is big money over there so there naturally be opposition if their monopoly is uh, challenged but beyond I, that i think see these uh, issues would be there in the world all the time yeah but we should do whatever right for the society and okay. by the the potency of time our time will come time for satos will surely come one day okay oh, okay and you must be knowing brian joseph sir yes brian joseph sir the youngest nobel laureate i think scientist ah. in the super country he worked in later he worked on ayurveda oh really i didn't know that ha ah. he was fascinated by ayurveda ha ah. oh. there i'm telling you what has happened uh, in india is that india as a country didn't recognize its own core values hmm. india as a country just like china pours money wherever it thinks that this is where we can establish ourselves india didn't pour money into sanskrit studies india didn't pour money into ayurveda it didn't anchor eh it may be because we were not ready that's for sure hmm. that's why it didn't happen yeah but uh, are you but i i do think that things are changing isn't it the last yes, few, yes. few decades yeah we see people start doing research and they demonstrate uh, you know obviously you see in this is everything will change according to people's choice it will not go by according to what pharma company they may win for a decade or two but they cannot win all the time so if we offer something of value yeah. people will take it take it and then that's how we can actually change yes yeah yeah in one sense if you consider the whole a whole rising of vegan that was against the meat packing industry but still it has risen right its own way okay yeah so but uh, compare uh, going back to the question of ayurveda see there are we could say homeopathy ayurveda and there are various other non conventional or alternative forms of medicine now sometimes if we talk about differentiation between science and pseudo science often homeopathy is given as an example of what is not considered scientific now there are papers also which try to homeopaths try to prove that it is scientific but so what i was asking is how much is ayurveda on the is it is it on the cusp of acceptability or is it on the border lines or is it becoming increasingly accepted what in the mean I, i i don't have an answer for this question because i have hardly worked in ayurveda nor i have any no so, so no uh, so, no no detail okay no sanjay right one so when you quoted ayurveda that was not so much because you are talking about ayurveda as a science it just that is the knowledge resource you are drawing from so that we could have something which could demonstrate empirically yeah see how i got some idea about ayurveda is that uh, one of my students he worked on bhasma oh okay in ayurveda bhasmas are like uh, what is that called uh, antibiotic antibiotic okay what is antibiotic it has to work very fast oh right suppose you have a inflammation throat inflammation you take antibiotic right okay so so in ayurveda we we actually we have a patent on laho bhasma we have a patent on laho bhasma so that is how we started actually we wanted some targeted uh, drug delivery um, uh, but uh, the student got phd and he is now a faculty in, in one of the nits but the idea was that what is this bhasma or ayurvedic bhasma are made from poisonous poisonous substance i'll just give you the example of mercury okay so mercury is a poison Hmm. But mercury is mostly used for Ayurvedic purpose. 
the reason is any poison that spreads in the body very fast so okay. when you make the mercury as a medium of drug transfer in your body then it works very fast okay so this is the big science the only thing is that what is why ayurvedic pasma has not uh, you know has not taken a big uh, leap the reason is this bhasma production they have so many layers the traditional bhasma preparation takes at least 4 months sometimes 6 months oh. you see in 6 months the the the, the so called allopathy fellows they provided a vaccine to but here just bhasma preparation takes you 6 months hmm so the loho bhasma that we made we reduced that time which was 4 months to almost some hour or a day okay so 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 of course you know uh, you know yeah, this is- can have this can have lot of research uh, uh, you know direction but yes um you know i have not gone. see no so i understand what you're making no i was just giving you an so i understand what you're coming from and my question was not to get into the technicalities here uh, so what you are saying is that uh, there is a whole a whole you could say in order to make ayurvedic principles also say examinable or replicable by modern science it is not just that uh, the two are different but there is a lot of investment of effort and energy and as the finances required only then that will happen so like bhasma cannot be mass produced the way science produces some by way pharmacy produces some things so yes so overall you know the indian maybe this can be last question the indian government also established this ayush i think the last decade or so and they also trying to at least they are trying to promote uh, uh, indian forms of knowledge you could say so have you also explored a possibility of working with the government at national level because that could escalate the, that could uh, expand your reach substantially or you feel that you need some tangible research first before you can approach them you say that uh, <laughs> ayurveda is not my No, I'm not talking about Ayurveda. Not at all. Uh-huh. I'm not Ayurveda. But I'm talking about the areas of research which you are doing. Yeah, yeah. See, see. That is why I'm saying because Ayush is connected to Ayurveda, and I'm not really. Uh, this is not oh, my okay. field. This is not my field. Agreed. But agreed. My, so, but, my, but, my point oh, so here the is field which, the field which you are working in. Uh-huh. This would fall in broadly in cognitive science. Cognitive or where would, science. Okay. As a you now, see, my original field is AI. Okay. But. but my own studies of bhagavad sankhya and other thing has brought me no now to this field of cognitive science right so so it is a is a, is a step uh in a direction because i am looking uh in which area we should establish the university so that our university will, will be uniquely known that we have contributed to a specific uh area and okay. uh, so that is why uh, we am i'm setting only two departments and uh, i know that next two decades i will have only these two department because they have a lot to contribute sanskrit and theology studies and uh, cognitive science these two department has a profound implication uh, for the future of the human kind That's, oh okay this two very opinion. different fields isn't it you know sanskrit studies will go in more in humanities and cognitive science will come in science no, it, this is this is this is this is where there is a there is a complementarity oh, see okay. there is a complementary sanskrit is not simply language you see in in vedanta what happens the at perfection experiencer and experience they are same 
there is no distinction. The language and thought, no distinction. Okay. The distinction disappears. Okay. So, mm. so in that sense, uh, the Sanskrit, I am not looking at simply a, 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 a syntactic language. I am looking at Sanskrit as a, a semantic language uh, that has that can uh, contribute to the human growth in terms of uh, cognitive ability. Um, it has a oh. huge future. So, okay. so the, the way Sanskrit, like for example, you know, we had so many Sanskrit pundits in India. They could not figure out Sanskrit is the mother of Indo-European languages. It is Sir William Jones from UK who has to land in uh, Kolkata in some 17th century. And uh, he, at, at some point of time, he would establish that Sanskrit is the mother of all Indo-European language. So, I mean, is that accepted today? Because now currently, yes, from what is. I understood, it is. Their it is accepted. They, it is no, accepted. They talk, now they talk about some Proto-Indo-European language from which both Latin and, Latin and Greek came and Sanskrit also came. No, 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 no. But Sanskrit as a mother of all Indo-European language is established. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It is that's, established. That's significant. So you're saying that there has to be a breadth of vision about what exactly we should, of yeah. how we can present our own traditions yeah, yeah. so that people can be appreciated. And, appreciate. and you see that uh, all our drama forms, performing arts, paintings, everything is connected in all these two subjects. Okay. All our cultural traditions, all will come in this. Okay, so it's a very broad field in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Not, okay. It is not the way people look at Sanskrit and theology. Or uh, they oh, look. Okay. So, and, and, and these two are complementary to each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's amazing. But this is a grand vision and I'm sure our viewers will be inspired. I myself appreciating the the breadth of the scope, once we start going into this field, it is, we want to at one level help people to become Krishna conscious, but it's like a pyramid. And we help people to rise to Sattva Guna and they appreciate and they themselves will explore. And this is a very, we could say, a very appealing way of ultimately getting uh, people to appreciate Krishna consciousness because otherwise directly Krishna consciousness might seem sectarian to some people. You're simply promoting a sect. But here it's almost like you're promoting wisdom and welfare for society in a language that or in a way that people can appreciate. You're addressing their needs and then they become more open to exploring uh, exploring the tradition from which these resources are being provided. That's remarkable. Thank you so much for sharing this. So you, Usually at the end of a podcast, I try to summarize what we discussed. And then maybe if you want to add a few words at conclusion, you can add that. Can I try to summarize or are there something? Sure, else? sure. Please go ahead. Okay. So today we discussed about uh, broadly the topic of how, how uh, because a broad Vedic tradition can contribute in the world of science. You talk about your own journey, how you're very philosophically inclined and you studied the Bhagavad Gita, but it was when you came when it associated with devotees, the scientific approach attracted you and then you used it to present like origins and books like that. How? you realize that the data is there, but we can explain and interpret the data in different ways. And based that on is, that, that is, that is, that is actually the impact of Rasaraj Prabhu. Rasaraj Prabhu, yeah. I mean, yeah, Sadapur yeah. model of, you talk about both those things, but the idea yeah. is that you said that the focus of your own area of specialization just come about. So the Vrindavan Gurukul is not just to say, it's not just a Gurukul, it's the foundation for whole university. And in that area, we talked about the effect of, uh, so at one level we accept, which I found as striking that our business is not to criticize science. We recognize that sci Prabhupada also gave credit to science because it looked for the subtle element beyond the gross and science will by nature be empirical. 
and if we try to expand the domain of science beyond the empirical it is prone to be vulnerable to prone to get mixed with pseudo science so rather than trying to do that what we do is that we provide we show how within the empirical domain our traditions resources can provide solutions and answers which are not otherwise which are not which will challenge the model of the reality or the model of the world that empirical science holds on to that current science holds on to and one example of that is how alkaline soil could be converted into livable soil and although the chemical composition is the same so similarly it discussed about how the ra- the the ra- rag bhairavi which was rag rag darbari rag darbari rag darbari how that can lead to empirical changes you said the cross talk between the various lobes of the brain decreases and that's how people's cogn- there's cognitive enhancement in their functioning and then similarly you discussed about various other principles like bhasma and then also uh, basically the idea that within our tradition there are many resources by which we can empirically demonstrate what what are the benefits and because uh, today also people are becoming more open and receptive to things that work so if we can actually for offer solutions to problems existing in the world today then that can ex- that can ex- increase people's receptivity and not only to the specific solutions but also to the sources from which those solutions have come and in that way to the university which you, you have you have you are pioneering in in vandav and the gurukul is is a vision so that our traditions wisdom can be made available at a broad level for to benefit people and then to attract them to ultimately krishna consciousness so any things you would like to add prabhu no i think you have uh, summarized very nicely <laughs> very Thank nicely you. say say that the two 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 things we any university we want to establish it should acknowledge the the success of science is that it looks for subtle cause yes cross manifestation and second empiricism must be the way of science otherwise uh, uh you see that uh, we must you know i was uh, uh, contemplating on the bhagavad sankhya where prabhupada in one of the purport is saying we should always doubt even the greatest yeah. of greatest of devotees they doubt whether they have their devotion or not right so so to say that whatever i say is absolute uh that is not the uh, way uh, we can reform the society so it is better that whatever we say is empirically verified so oh, hence okay empiricism empiricism must be the way of science although we know veda is aparishya veda is absolute knowledge is absolute but when we that we bring that from the level of purity to the level where we are living we cannot bring as it is and say we are throwing it mm. now it must be given an empirical way that's thank beautiful. you so much uh, <laughs> thank you for this point about doubt i think <laughs> that is a very striking insight of bhagavad sankhya also doubt is a sign of intelligence you know and yeah. when we doubt then when we don't we are not demanding faith rather we are providing evidence so yeah. that doubters can be addressed doubters concerns can be addressed it's beautiful exactly. thank yeah. you very much true for your time it's wonderful to have your association and to to listen to your experiences insights and your aspirations thank you thank you chetan charan prabhu thank you thank you making me part of your podcast thank you thank you hari krishna hari krishna